Hi folks, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm super excited to be speaking with Dr. Scott Symington. He recently wrote a book called Freedom from Anxious Thoughts and Feelings, a two-step mindfulness approach for removing beyond fear and worry. And I will of course have all the links in the description below, as well as in our article on our website. And I just want to give you a little background. Dr. Symington is a licensed clinical psychologist who's passionate about helping individuals and couples move towards greater freedom, aliveness, and intimacy. This passion has led to a specialty in treating anxiety disorders, sexual issues, including sexual addictions, uh, mood disorders, life transitions, and unhealthy relationship patterns. Today, we're going to be talking specifically about anxiety, negative thoughts, those types of things. And we're going to be reviewing a lot of the different tools and strategies in his book. And I have to say, first, I read this book. I absolutely loved it. I've been using some of the tools in here, and I found them extremely helpful. As a person who formally and kind of presently suffers from anxiety and stressful thoughts or anxious thoughts, I have to say this has been one of the most useful tools that I've tried in a while. So, doctor, do you mind if I call you Scott? Please, Please. do. You, Scott. So I want to ask you um, if there's anything you want to add about your background of working um, as a clinician <laughs> with patients or... Um, anything you want to add about your background here, by all means, do so. And at the same time, maybe you can answer, what was the driving force? I'm sure you've been asked this many times, but we would love to know what the driving force was for you to write this book. Yeah. By the way, it was a very comprehensive uh, intro. Thank oh. you. <laughs> and yeah, the driving force really at the core was this understanding that we really don't know what to do inside our heads when we start to worry, we start to feel anxious or a destructive mood or feeling shows up inside us. We're really not clear on what to do on the inside, the specific mental and emotional steps to free our mind to feel better. And obviously I'm, I'm a human being, so I experience these challenges as well, and I'm in the lives of my clients, and and just and on the one hand, recognizing that there are evidence-based strategies, things that really can promote freedom and well-being if we know how to apply them, but then also being aware that there they can be challenging to apply, and it's it's you need to be able to really know what to do in the moment when you're when you're overwhelmed. And so I wanted to come up with a really user-friendly way of helping people apply what works. And obviously and a lot of your patients have been having great success with with a lot of your modalities and Yeah, and it it emerged out of my clinical work at the two screen method which is uh, featured in the book and yeah, it's it's great too because we were um, sharing before we went live here that you know this piece that we're alone inside our internal world. Nobody's in our head with us or really right with us when we have a challenging feeling, and it can be hard to know what to do in those spaces. Even if we've read a helpful book, even if we've learned a, a helpful idea in those spaces we can be at a loss as to what do i do with my mind what do i do with my life energy to make this less powerful inside me and and this method that emerged out of my clinical work really kind of helps people in that space and, and actually helps them communicate with others what their challenge is and and what the specific steps are needed to take in, the, in those spaces Mm -hmm. So, can we talk about the um, the two screen method, um, which you call TMS in your book? Can we just give our listeners like a brief um, idea of what they are and how and how it works? Yeah. So, the two screen method um, it is a user friendly application of mindfulness. 
and it, and it guides you through the specific mental and emotional steps that de-energize problematic thoughts and feelings. And it's based on an image. And what you do is you imagine your internal world. It's all the different thoughts that can come into your mind, feelings that show up inside you as a media room with two screens. Okay, so on the forward facing wall is the front screen. You're on my front screen right now. And that's uh, the present moment. It's the more life-giving thoughts, feelings, images. It's, it's your uh, deeply held values, your connection, uh, you know, that, that's all that internal activity when you're basically saying to yourself, ah, today's a pretty good day. I feel pretty content. Maybe things aren't perfect, but you're in a, in a pretty good space. That's a sign that you're attuned to the front screen. We're all naturally trying to stay on the front screen. Mm -hmm. Challenges off to the right, still inside our mind, is a side screen. And that's where the threats, fears, insecurities, and destructive moods show up. So this is often how these screens show up in our daily life. Let's say you are walking away from a terribly awkward social interaction and you're trying to stay on the front screen and you walk away and then suddenly that side screen off to the right lights up and then your internal eyes swivel over to take a look and then across that side screen is the thought, oh my gosh, that was such a stupid thing to say. And you're away in your mind, now scrolling through those social tapes, what you said, what they said, that awkward pause. And if you hang out there too long on that side screen, you're in danger of entering a worry loop and then and, and getting sucked into that side screen. And before you know it, that side screen will become an IMAX theater with Dolby surround sound <laughs> and you can't rotate back to the front screen. Okay. So, and this happens in lots of different ways because that side screen, it's energized by some very predictable sources, such as the spotlight of attention. So the two screen method, which has two steps, so shows you how to relate to your side screen in a way where it will fade into the background. That's the, the first step. And then the second step gives you some front screen tethers or anchors so that, so that you don't go away in your mind and energize that side screen and that you also move forward in your life and take positive action. You make lemonade out of lemons. So when you have an anxious feeling, you use that energy, you redirect it in a positive way to move your, your life forward. So that's a very brief overview. Of course, I wrote a whole book on it, but that that's the that's the synopsis. Wonderful. So yeah, I have to say, um, like I've been, like I said before, I've been trying this myself, and it's amazing how such a simple mind trick is what I like to call it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to verbalize what it is. It's it's like. You kind of have to condition yourself to do it a few times, but once you do it, your brain like goes there. Like I had, like any time I had an anxious thought, I, I did that to screen and then I had to like remind myself, but then one day I had some anxious thoughts and it was just there. It just yeah. appeared. So it's like you start training your brain and it just appears. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And that doesn't mean that it's always easy to do. So for example, let's say an anxious thought came into your mind in this moment and I'm on your front screen, you're needing to attend here in, in the present moment. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like having an anxious heckler on the sidelines over right. there <laughs> saying some distressing, distracting things to you and that's that's not easy. I mean, if it, if that anxious heckler is throwing mud balls at you and hurling insults, and you're trying to do an interview with me, that is not easy. But what we're interested in is de-energizing that anxious heckler, that side screen over there, so that it has less power in your internal world. And what we know that it feeds off of, like how you would throw that heckler a fatty steak, is going away in your head and arguing with it, monitoring the heckler, mm -hmm. trying to push the heckler away, like all of that would give it energy and then take you off what's meaningful or what the task at hand is in this moment on the, on the front screen. So 
But that doesn't mean that it's always easy. People well, when no, they I'm feel sure like there are moments like the one you just gave an example of. But I, I just was like having normal anxiety like that everybody uh, has. So for that type of thing, it really worked great because it allowed me just to pull my focus back and stop fretting over. I mean, and your book gives so many great examples yeah. of how your mind plays these games with worry and anxious thoughts and stuff. So, uh, um, and that the good point that sometimes all you have to do is remind yourself to redirect attention and that's it when it's at lower levels. Right. 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 Yeah. And the other, the other thing is when you just even bring the two screen image to mind, you are creating separation between your core self and the thoughts and feelings that show up inside you. Cause we have a tendency to over identify mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. thoughts coming into our mind that feeling showing up. And so when you when you start practicing bringing that image to mind, it puts you in that observer seat. And if we get into mindfulness later, that's a pillar of mindfulness, is right. learning how to observe internal activity, activity rather than fusing it, getting letting it define you and whip you around, but actually being able to watch it a little bit, having some more space. Yeah, our brain has a negative bias it's it's most interested in looking and encoding those things that could be harmful hurtful jeopardize things that are valuable to us and isn't always so concerned with the good stuff right so it, it's it's looking for the, the problems the good news is we can actually train our brain to encode more of the positive I, i'll often recommend that the clients each day try to capture two meaningful moments. And, and it's a very subjective, personal thing. It might be looking into the face of a loved one or seeing a cool view or a burst of uh, inspiration, but that you every day say to yourself, today I'm going to capture two or three meaningful moments and then just remind yourself of those at the end of the day. And there you can train your brain to have more of a container for that. Yeah, the end of yeah. it kind of went into a lot of detail into it. about that. I really appreciated that because gratitude yeah. is something that we often forget to do in our daily lives, and that's a great distraction for negativity. Um, speaking of distraction, you also go into HDAs, which are healthy distractions and activities, and I'm a yes. huge believer in this. Um, as someone who did suffer from chronic anxiety, um, healthy distractions and activities are essential. Can you go yeah. into some of that with our listeners, please? Yeah, so with, with the two screen method, part of, or the second step is learning how to stay more tethered to the front screen with your attention and life energy. So one of those front screen anchors is healthy distractions and activities, HDAs. So. So the uh, healthy distractions and activities serve a protective factor, but then beyond that, they, uh, that HDA anchor provides you an opportunity to, in that challenging space, do something very positive with your life. Maybe that's uh, um, get some exercise or express your creativity, um, do something that meets another one of your need states that are easy to neglect in, in a busy life. There, so I don't know how much you want to unpack like the different facets of it, but, but yeah, I, I'm a big believer that people should do some really good work in identifying very specific things they can do physically that would fall in that category, whether that's a jog or taking a hike or a dance class that they are identifying specific activities that bring them pleasure, specific activities that are enlivening, that, that are an injection of aliveness in their life, so that when they become overwhelmed, they can look at the, the, a menu of possible tasks and redirect that anxious energy towards one of those tasks. And, and what's it really great does. About yeah, and work. your website is perfect. It is like a, a gold mine for 
healthy distractions, <laughs> distractions and activities. Thank you. Lots Thank you. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Um, you know, you also mentioned about the freedom ladder I just thought of, and that really impressed me as well. Can you just, I just want to go over some of the key areas in your book that really stood out to me. So that was one mm -hmm. of them. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and what it is and does? Yes. The, the freedom ladder is a, a way of systematically approaching things that make you anxious, that, that you're afraid of. And really, it's retraining the threat center of the brain. See, there's a part of our brain that's always scanning for potential threats, things that violate our sense of safety, security, being in control. Okay. And of course, this and, goes and back to what? Fight, 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 fight or flight kind of thing? Flight, kind of thing. Very much, yeah, very much, yeah, that talking about the same thing. So there, there's this threat center that's always out there and it's very trigger happy and it has a low IQ. Like it just <laughs> went in doubt, pulled the trigger. That could be that could be a threat. So let's be anxious about it. And that's how it warns us that something could be anxious through nervous feelings and anxious thoughts. Now, if we then start avoiding those sources of anxiety and fear, we actually confirm its threat status. We say to the threat center of the brain, you were right, that is a threat, so let's move around it. Let's drive instead of flying, or let's not go to the dentist, or whatever it might be, because that is a danger to self. And we reinforce that, that threat status. So the freedom ladder is an antidote to that. It is a way of retraining your threat center where we lead it and say, hey, threat center, look at me. Let me show you something. Yeah, this may not be preferable going to the dentist, but it's not going to kill me. It, there's no threat here. Right? And, and, and really what makes it threatening is the anxiety, not, not necessarily right. The, right. the actual procedure, although some are not a lot of fun. So, but, so what the Freedom Ladder does is it retrains the threat center by breaking down certain tasks. Like if you are anxious driving over bridges, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. or let, let's go, let's go even more general. Let's say you, you are anxious driving on freeways and you've been avoiding freeway driving. So the first step might be looking at a YouTube video of somebody else driving on the freeway because it's a lower level anxiety. Okay. Maybe you take a side street that's really close to the freeway uh, a few days later, maybe then you have somebody in the car with you and you get on the freeway and get off on the next set. So you basically, you break down whatever that, that fearful task or issue is into smaller parts. And then you slowly move up the freedom ladder, teaching your brain, this is not a danger. And then it, it turns down the volume uh, on the exact, on the anxiety. I love that. I love it. So you're like desensitizing yourself slowly so your brain understands that it's and you use driving on the highway in your book. This poor lady suffered from that. And um, I can kind of relate to that, too. So <laughs> it is a little unnerving. Yeah, it's because when we feel anxious, that is the mental, emotional and physical experience of being under threat. And it's real that experience that you're having is real even if it's attached to something in the external world right. that objectively is not dangerous to you you're having the experience as if it is and that's a very hard thing to ignore i mean avoidance is natural it just it, it's just when it can we can avoid things at times that really are genuinely not a threat and then we need to retrain that threat center of the brain if we want to be free people and live a full life. Right, I agree. Right. Now you mentioned right. you too about acceptance and how it's such a powerful tool for like diffusing negative thoughts and feelings. How can someone apply this um, when they're like in the midst of suffering such desperate anxiety? It takes a lot of courage to just say, you know, just to tell someone, okay, you know, you need to accept or have acceptance like can you just give us a little bit of your opinion on that because I know a lot of folks that suffer so painfully 
it's debilitating their anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. And if you just walk in and say you need to accept it, they'll probably throw something at you, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because it's, but this, this highlights the challenge we have with language, the limitations of language. And this is why I came up with the two screen method, because what does acceptance mean? I mean, I know based on research and my clinical work that if, if you're in an anxious state and you move into non-resistance and accept that anxious feeling and don't fight it, that it will begin to lift. But how are you to know exactly how to do that? What right. that means? Right. I know what I mean, but then you have to translate that into very uh, concrete action steps inside your mind and internal world. And that is often where the breakdown is. And that, that's why um, I came up with the two screen method. So acceptance is a tricky word. I, with a lot of my clients, I use the word allow, like allow the feeling to be there because we, we're we not saying that we like the feeling, that we agree with that troubling idea, that we want it to be there. It's suffering. The question is, are we going to suffer well or are we going to suffer in an unhealthy way and take what is painful and then graft torture on top of the pain. Mm -hmm. The pain is hard enough as it is. We don't want to graft an extra layer of torture on, on what is pain. So the pain has arrived. The question is, how are we going to relate to the pain? And there are healthy ways of relating to pain uh, that will cause it to dissipate over time and, and help us live the best day and life that we can. And then there are unhealthy ways that we can relate to it that are natural, by the way, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. want protective reflexes, but uh, unhealthy ways of relating to that pain that draw us <laughs> away from what's important and keep it energized, perpetuate the pain. And early on in my practice, I was really struck with this idea that we have a relationship with thoughts and feelings. And it's, it's, it's such a simple concept, but it, it's easy to miss, which is there are all these thoughts that come into our mind and feelings that we experience. Mm -hmm. And then there mm -hmm. is our relationship to that internal activity, our set of responses. And if we want to be fully alive and free as people, we need to learn how to strike a healthy relationship with internal challenges. And that is challenging because it's not natural. The, the, the natural relationship, or I'm sorry, the most healthy way to respond to an anxious, overwhelming feeling is not a natural response. But, and, and what I mean by that is when, when we feel anxious, right, that is the mental, emotional, and physical experience of being under threat, the human organism is designed to neutralize threats, either run away from it, monitor it, analyze it, get rid of it in some way. Like we're built to do that. And, and thousands of years ago when that was a predator or an invading tribe, yeah, that, that made a lot of sense. But we apply that same threat strategy inside our minds where we want to monitor and run that idea through over and over and again. We want to neutralize that overwhelming feeling inside us, get away from it, but then it ends up backfiring. It ends up actually giving a juice and energy and taking over more and more. So part of the reason why mindfulness is such a big thing these days is that when people practice mindfulness, it is cultivating this new healthy relationship with problematic thoughts and feelings to kind of override these threat strategies that get us in trouble. I know I just threw a lot at you there, but. <laughs> no, 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 it was exactly spot on. And in your book, you talk about mindfulness a lot. Can you just give us a quick summary of how it connects to TSM and what you mean by mindfulness? Yeah, mindfulness is used in a lot of different contexts, but within the context of psychology, just a quick definition, one might be being more uh, present moment focused while staying non-judgmentally uh, detached from problematic thoughts and feelings. Okay, so it, it's this idea of 
being more present, moment focused, accepting or allowing or painful thoughts and feelings and and creating a little bit more space, almost like a interspectator where there's your center and then these experiences showing up inside you. So that that gives you just a, a an overview of, of what mindfulness is. Now in terms of the two screen method, you apply it or it's being applied in three main areas. One is when when you bring the image of two screens to mind, mm-hmm. where there's a front screen and then the side screen, so that on that side screen you can see the anxious thoughts scrolling across and feel the anxious heat coming off it. When you bring that to mind, you are uh, positioning yourself as an internal observer where you are not the thought or feeling, you are watching it. Yeah, it's inside you, it's, it's a product of your mind and it's showing up inside you, but you're in that watching position and that is a key feature of mindfulness, being an impartial spectator, if you will, of right. the passing right. one. So that, that's one way that it's applied. The first step in the two screen method, when that side screen lights up, so we use the social anxiety example, Mm -hmm. right? Walking Mm -hmm. away from that awkward social interaction, side screen lights up, you're hanging out with those worrisome thoughts on the side screen. The first step is accept and redirect. Redirect your attention to the front screen, which is often the present moment, while allowing that tape to play in your peripheral vision. Those worries, that anxious feeling, that those unwelcome ideas, almost like having an anxious heckler on on the sideline. So when you apply accept and redirect, that is also applying mindfulness. You're you're moving into non-resistance. You're allowing sort of the uncomfortable thing to be present inside you, but without giving it your attention, without dwelling on it. So and you're like the, recentering, so you, right? You're kind of like recentering yourself, but allowing at the same time to acknowledge that you are having these. You know, I read, I think on your website where you said, and of course, if it's misquoting, I'm sorry, something about this this being a ridiculously easy like way to deal with. And it really is. I mean, didn't you say that on your website somewhere? Yeah, yeah, it's like a graphical user interface for your internal, <laughs> right? Because like with Win before Windows came out, it was all code, right? You just right. had streams of right. that. And then it was more of a point and click. I mean, that that's what I'm trying to offer in a way is this graphical user, uh, user interface where it's like, okay, go here with your attention. Okay, have this attitude and disposition to the challenging, anxious thought or feeling that's in your peripheral vision and and introducing people to this idea of relating to their internal world visually and spatially with this with this very kind of intuitive universal image and then as they do that Mm -hmm. they are using the most advanced psychological principles and strategies they're using evidence-based methods simply by just relating to the image as directed where there's a lot going on behind the scenes but now how does this work when somebody's like in the throes of an anxiety attack like in your experience how does someone use this while they're feeling all of these physical you know symptoms yes great question it's easier to apply this method before that side screen has become an IMAX theater with Dolby surround sound, right? So in the midst of a panic attack, you're not going to be doing what we're describing. There, the, you, you've got to implement uh, a, another step before you go into that formation because that, that side screen is just blaring. I mean, it's the jumbotron and it's screaming and it's just not real. Like, find that little side screen. It's like a little pinhole a mile <laughs> off, right? You know, it's going to be very hard to stay tethered to the front screen. What I advise for people is engage in a grounding exercise first. 
you have to turn down the volume and get anchored before you can begin applying the two screw method. So we're talking about high level anxiety. You're mm. almost at that mm. panic attack level, right? Taking some deep breaths, feeling your feet on the floor, opening up your scope of awareness, really listening to the sounds around you, the sights, noticing the temperature of the table or uh, uh, describing the, the cloth that is nearby that you're rubbing your fingers on. So it is uh, rallying the five senses okay, to ground yourself in the present moment. And, and usually one sensory experience is super sticky for people. Usually it's the auditory one. So if they were for two minutes just to hyper-focus on every sound they could detect in their environment, they'd be able to do that, even in the most anxious state. And what that does is it activates the, the experiential focus network in the brain. So there's a particular brain region that it brings online. And that uh, experiential focus brain network is incompatible with what's called the narrative focus network in the brain, which is when we're stuck in a worry loop and overwhelmed with anxiety. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if we can get you into the experiential focus with a grounding exercise, by default, we've popped you out of the narrative focus, that place where you were stuck, right? So it's not like nirvana after this grounding exercise. Okay? You're still feeling anxious and you're thawing out from the storm, but it just, it helps you step back a little bit and it turns down the volume where then you can begin implementing uh, the, the, the two steps and the two screen methods. And that makes a lot of sense because you're right. Because with the throes of panic, I mean, you have to get centered first and then you can start practicing. Because a lot of folks, they don't like to take medication. Anxiety and depression medications are not for everybody. And um, that's why when I read your book, I was super excited because tools like this really make a big difference. They really do. Because I think if you can control the little bits of anxiety that happen during the day, you can prevent the nuclear meltdown from happening. Absolutely. The day. Absolutely. Because a lot of times there's a backstory to anxious episodes. Yes. It's, right. It's being fed cultivated over time. I mean, it's it's fascinating, isn't it, that that most of us were just not aware of what we're doing a lot of times internally. Like, and, and that's why I often um, ask my clients when we start working together, three, four, or five times a day, just pause and ask yourself, where's my mind right now? Our mind is always somewhere. Mm -hmm. We just don't really mm -hmm. think about it. And it's interesting when they begin practicing that, they realize like, oh my gosh, I, I'm mentally drifting with all sorts of negative scenarios all the time that I didn't realize. So even just raising awareness, where is my mind right now? Where is the spotlight of attention? And it's it really matters because life is really what we attend to. I mean, absolutely. It, absolutely. And it's interesting because anxiety is such a sneaky little devil that mm -hmm. um, like I've had periods of calm for days and like I could just be sitting working and all of a sudden have a panic attack out of nowhere because in yeah. the back of your conscious, you know, you've got all this stuff going on that you're not aware of in, in your peripheral and bam, you can have a panic attack. Yeah. yeah. So raising awareness in terms of building a very good profile of your anxious side screen. What are those thoughts? What are those feelings? Even at a much lower level, like what's the first sign? Where do you feel in your body? What are your common triggers? Right. So yes. that you, you catch it and you diffuse it when it's first showing up. Right. right. Now, in your book, you talk about something very important, I thought. Um, before we, we close, you, you mentioned six cognitive disorders and how they create thoughts and anxiety. Can you just go over some of them for our listeners so they can just be aware of like some of the things in their day that, you know, and some of the reasons why we suffer from anxiety? And are, are you referring to 
like, like just all or nothing thinking over general yeah. yeah yeah so there there are six sort of unhealthy thinking patterns that we've identified and and you could say there's more than six I mean, researchers go back and forth or they're 10 or they're six or the four mm -hmm. there's a there's a lot of overlap but i but i think six sort of capture most of the territory and and they are six ways of thinking that promote negative mood states and anxiety but for sure when it comes to depressed moods and in the book i also get into depression and addictive behaviors and, and things like that so these these six um core negative beliefs are in that uh depressive side screen chapter but they relate to anxiety as well right so uh, one is our tendency for all or nothing um, thinking, and that is a black and white thinking. And that if I don't get an A, I'm a complete failure. So a lot of times perfectionism is, is fueled by all or nothing thinking. There's nothing in between. Uh, the second one is overgeneralization, right? And that is taking an experience and then assuming that okay that's just going to be the entire experience mm -hmm. for for mm -hmm. my life if if some if this person doesn't want to date me then nobody wants to date me right so you you take that experience and then you just amplify it and go go broadly okay and obviously that's a depressing anxious thought if nobody on the planet wanted to date you and you wanted to be in a relationship the the third one is confirmation bias and that is having a certain belief about self or the world or others, and then only collecting data that fits that pet theory, and then letting all the data that suggests otherwise just float right on by. And and we are we're you know very good at that. So maybe somebody has a an internal belief of not being liked, like nobody likes me. So they go to the store and they're greeted with smiles a, a, a friend texts them wishes them a good day but then somebody cuts them off in traffic it's like okay see nobody likes me right and it just confirms but the other data points they just go right go right on by the other uh another one is jumping to conclusions the best way to flush this one out is let's say you're walking in your neighborhood down a sidewalk and and it's maybe the sun's going down you can't see that well and on the other side of the sidewalk is your neighbor going the other way and you say hi jack and jack just looks down and keeps walking okay so if we lined up 10 people and said why did jack just do what he did one person might say i always knew jack was a jerk okay or he must be mad at me or another person might say, I wonder if he had a hard day. I wonder if he's lost someone important to him, right? So the, the point being, we have to be so careful in our interpretations of other people and events that are hard for us. And, and we're prone to coming up with certain negative interpretations when we really have no idea often. We really don't know. I, I sometimes, and I can't say I always do this, but sometimes when somebody really frustrates me on the road, does something that's just kind of jerky, all right, I, I try to tell myself, who knows, maybe there's uh, a pregnant wife in the front seat and they're rushing to the hospital. Like, it's possible. I mean, he could be a jerk, but we don't know, right? <laughs> the thing is, just being cautious about the conclusions uh, you know, that, that we make. So the last two are emotional reasoning, where the feeling makes it so. I, I work a lot with people that have experienced trauma in their childhood. And often what goes hand in hand with trauma is a sense of I am bad. Like at their core, they really feel like they're unlovable or bad. Mm -hmm. Not just, oh, I've been a bad person. No, like I am bad. And, and if people get too close to me, they'll discover that or I don't deserve good things in life because I'm bad. 
at, at my core. And, and they really do feel that. And so a lot of the work is, yeah, acknowledging that feeling, what gave rise to that feeling, but not acting as if in life that that feeling is true and opening up a container for things that don't fit that, right? And just, and being careful that, you know, we are, especially in today's world, it's a very feeling-based culture. And there's some really good aspects of that. I mean, we are much more attuned to our emotional life. There's a lot more empathy than there used to be, emotional integration. So there's tons of positive aspects of that. The downside is, Sometimes we listen too much to feelings. We, we want to wait right. until right. we take positive action, until the feeling shows up. But often we have to act first, and then that positive feeling will show up. Our, our feelings won't always help us in life in, in the way that we well, want no. to. I mean, I think it's a thing for us to remember, too, that it's, you know, facts before feelings lots of times, and, and people kind of flip it. And they think they're feelings of the world and they're not. But I, I'm so glad that we spoke today because especially with the last grouping of um, cognitive like distortions that we think about, I want folks to know that there's a gamut of reasons why they could be suffering from anxiety and that there's hope and help out there. And you don't necessarily have to take medications if you don't want to that there are other methodologies that they can practice and read about and that was like i said before one of the reasons why i really loved reading your book i, I found a lot of comfort in your book knowing that i'm not alone in a lot of um the way we think and the thoughts that run through our heads and i really want folks to know that there's hope and help and for them and that there are simple things that they can do to help themselves um, get over these things and not suffer. It, it, that is such a great message and that's why I'm, I'm a therapist. I believe there is so much out there that can help people and that people do not have to be stuck and to suffer, that there is so much out there it can be helpful. And I'm a freedom junkie. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm in this field. And that's what that is what fuels me as a person to really encourage people to get the information and tools they need to live a good life, to feel better, to not be privately in battle, to go for it, right? Create, create that life that sings. I mean, that that's what it's all about. And one of the reasons why I like, and I know that's a weird word to use, why I like working with worry and anxiety is that on the one hand, it's one of the most torturous things you could experience. Mm. On the other, it's the most treatable condition. Um, and we have tons of evidence-based strategies and, 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 and there's all these principles and things that can really help people worry less and feel less anxious. So there's, People don't have to be stuck in chronic, hopeless anxiety. There, there are things that can be done. And, and, and I just, I hope that kind of with the two screen method, I'm just kind of a, an important link in that chain of, you know, helping people be more uh, free and live a good life. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's, it's a brilliant it's concept. A brilliant and, concept. Um, um, I, I'm just thrilled to be able to share it with folks that, that, you know, can maybe try it and get some relief from it. Is there a way that folks can reach out to you on your website if they have questions or do you have any, because like, you have a really nice website and I just want to be able to direct folks there if they want to purchase your book. It's also available on Amazon as well and I'll have all those links for people, but can they reach out to you with any questions or concerns as well? Oh, of course. I would encourage them to and when you go on my website, drsimonson.com, there's a, a way to email me and it goes right to my you know, personal email. And I love hearing from people. I mean, I can't tell you how much it means to me when you said that you've read my book and that you're benefiting from it, right? I mean, there were a lot of 3 a.m. mornings when I'm writing this book thinking, oh my gosh, like, I hope this helps people. And, and so it's such a, 
it's such an amazing confirmation and experience to be on this side of it. And just that if it can help somebody worry less, feel less anxious, I mean, nothing makes my day more. But yeah, any questions uh, your listeners have, I'd be happy to happy to connect with them. Thank you so much. Thanks. Is there any other key points that you would like to share uh, about your book or anything um, that you felt we left out? I get, the first step would be just getting a profile of your anxious side screen, right? writing down those worries that tend to come into your mind uh, or images that show up, kind of what the triggers are, where you tend to feel it in your body, and then just start uh, monitoring a little bit more where your mind is, where your attention is. Just mm -hmm. ask yourself several times a day, where is my mind right now? And when you find yourself hanging out on the side screen, practice that, accept and redirect. Rotate your eyes to the front screen and just a simple way to get started before you've read the book, just think of that as leaning into the present moment or engaging in a healthy distraction while letting that that um, unwelcome tape um, run in your peripheral vision and and just begin sort of working and understanding your thoughts and feelings in a new way uh, with just those two simple steps accept and redirect and then that second step of staying more tethered but okay, okay well i want to thank you so much this was jam packs with so much amazing information and uh, um i definitely recommend everybody Run out there and get a copy. It's really so informative and so very helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Slimington, for spending an hour with us. I know your time is so valuable, but we greatly appreciate thank it. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks.